Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first Tech Connect event. Thank you all for joining us. Our goal today is to create connections, learning opportunities, and generate excitement about the many opportunities for careers in technology for women and gender diverse individuals here in our province. My name is Sherry Bott, and I'm the CEO of Women in Resource Development Corporation, or WRDC, and my pronouns are she and her. Women are outnumbered in the tech scene. At WRDC, we are working to help close the gender gap and actively promote, inspire, and inform women, not only about all that the tech industry can offer them, but also what they can bring to the industry. Why does this matter? Research shows us that diverse teams perform better. Individuals from different genders, races, backgrounds, and experiences bring different perspectives that can lead to innovative solutions. Gender balance and diversity are good for business. The tech sector needs more women studying, working, and staying in tech to ensure there's enough talent for the future. The tech industry offers a wide variety of well-paying, rewarding careers, and it's imperative that women are there to not only reap the benefits, but also contribute to the developments in the industry. There has been a lot happening over the past few years, a lot of meetings and collaboration with many stakeholders working towards gender balance in tech. We want to keep the momentum going to achieve a fully diverse and inclusive tech industry. So while we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are all on today and which we each call home. I would like to acknowledge that I am joining today from the ancestral homelands of the Abiyathic and I acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Biafic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. For 25 years, WRDC has been changing the culture of work in industries and sectors that have historically been inaccessible and unwelcoming for women. We are a provincial nonprofit organization committed to increasing women's participation in technology and skilled trades. We offer a variety of programs and services to address challenges surrounding the attraction, recruitment, retention, and advancement of women in these careers. Our career and employment specialists have provided thousands of girls, women, and gender diverse individuals with the knowledge, resources, and supports they need to make informed career choices and to successfully train and advance in STEM and skilled trades. Our workplace DEI specialists have assessed and supported hundreds of employers, delivered training to thousands of employees and provided direct linkages to skilled and qualified women. Our experienced research consultants have designed, implemented and analyzed thousands of workplace inclusion surveys providing insight and evidence-based strategies to improve employee experiences, corporate culture, and inclusion. So WRDC is creating a local diverse skilled workforce and supporting employers in their efforts to create and maintain inclusive workplaces. WRDC is leading the way to gender equality in technology and skilled trades. Our key activities include career exploration programs, education and outreach, like our new STEM for Girls Club. All of our STEM for Girls programs engage girls in hands-on interactive learning activities, provide opportunities to interact with role models and instill the knowledge and confidence required to make informed career choices. We also provide career development and employment assistance services. Our certified career practitioners are located in satellite offices throughout the province. They provide one-on-one -on -one career and employment, uh, sorry, career and employment, 
uh, I'm lost my place. They provide one-on-one -on -one career and employment assistance services and oversee recruitment and delivery of career development programming including our Orientation to Trades and Technology, or OTT program, which is a flagship program, In Motion and Momentum Plus, and our new Digital Skills Foundations program. And if we're gonna get girls interested in women working in these careers, we want to ensure that employers they work for are welcoming and supportive. So we offer diversity, equity, and inclusion consultation services and training. Many organizations now recognize the value of diversity and inclusion, but they don't know how to implement effective systemic change. So WRDC acts as a diversity, equity, and inclusion incubator for small, medium-sized, and large businesses. We are often the initial point of contact for employers in these areas, and our services support employers as they start or continue their journey to creating a more diverse and inclusive work environment. We also conduct research, collaborate and partner with key stakeholders to identify solutions to issues commonly identified by women working in tech and trades. In addition to numerous research projects, we also sit on various local, regional and national boards, committees and advisory councils. So I encourage you all to visit wrdc.ca and stemforgirls.ca for more information on all our programs, services, and supports. We hope today's Tech Connect event is the first of many. Future events may focus on topics such as education and training options and creating direct connections to jobs and employers. If today's conversation piques your interest and you'd like to pursue a career in tech, we hope you stay connected with us and join us again for our future events. So before we get started with our panel uh, discussion, I do have a few housekeeping notes to share. So this event is being recorded and we encourage you to share this event with others so they may take advantage of the Tech Connect series as we build this network. We invite you to utilize the closed captioning feature. There are instructions in the chat if you're unfamiliar with that feature. Throughout our Tech Connect series, we are utilizing the Feed Loop platform, and we invite each of you to familiarize yourself with the accessibility features and learn how to navigate all aspects of Tech Connect through the virtual tour on the bottom left of the navigation bar within Feedloop. And finally, we thank everyone for submitting questions in advance through the registration process. We have pre-selected questions for today, but if you have additional questions for our panelists, we certainly invite you to utilize the Feedloop networking functions to reach out to them. So we are very happy to connect with such great panelists today, and we can't wait to hear more about their experiences and celebrate women in tech. While our panel is somewhat diverse in terms of their backgrounds and experiences, I would like to be completely open and transparent regarding the lack of diversity and representation of some groups, including racialized and women of color. You can't be what you can't see. We know how important it is to have role models at every stage of our career paths. And we strive to have representation of all women and gender diverse individuals in our programs and events. Uh, we know this is also an industry, in the, uh, sorry, an issue in the tech industry. And perhaps this is something we can talk about more during our discussion today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our fabulous panelists. In the interest of time, I will only provide a short introduction, but I encourage you to check out their full bios on our event page. So with us today, we have Carla Hayward. Carla is the manager of Tech Connect, or sorry, of Tech Talent at TechNL, directing the Tech Talent Strategy and working to close the talent gap in the local ecosystem. In her past, she has collaborated with leaders in local and global private enterprises, 
governments at all levels, and community organizations too numerous to list. We also have Neve Redmond. Neve is a UX research design and product strategy leader working in the technology and SaaS industry. As a consultant running her own business, she has partnered with a range of clients from high growth startups to world-class design agencies and Fortune 500 companies. Neve has helped design and build products and teams from North America to Europe, designing experiences for people worldwide. Neve was born in Dublin, Ireland, and immigrated to Canada in 2009. She volunteers as a STEM for Girls role model and recently joined WRDC's board of directors. Next, we have Mandy Woodland. Mandy has education and experience in biology, medical research, law, entrepreneurship, and technology innovation. And she has been fortunate enough to curate a career that allows her to use all of these experiences. Her day job is as digital strategy lead for Virtual Marine, a local business exporting solutions for lifeboat safety training worldwide. And in her free time, she started a digital health startup called Amp Health. Next, we have Megan Campbell. Megan is a neurodivergent writer, actor, and marketer. Megan is also a content marketer at Colab Software, one of Atlantic Canada's fastest growing tech startups. They've previously worked as marketing specialist for local tech company and as a copywriter for Atlantic Canada's largest marketing agency, where they contributed to award-winning campaigns. And last but certainly not least, we have Anna Gray Campbell. Anna Gray is the manager of community engagement at the Genesis Center. Through a mix of marketing, communications, events, and partnerships, her role helps Genesis clients to feel a part of a larger community. While encouraging the next generation of aspiring entrepreneurs to get involved. So let's get started with our conversation today. So our first question is for Carla. Carla, what can you tell us about what the tech industry looks like in Newfoundland and Labrador? What future opportunities do you see for women? Um, I think I'd like to tell you what it feels like before I tell you what it looks like. Um, I'm actually new to this industry myself, though my background is in you know digital technology and whatnot. Um, so I've still got a little bit of that, you know, new to the scene kind of vibe going on, but it feels so fresh and so exciting. Um, it feels young and fun, even though I'm not particularly young anymore. Um, but there is this sense of promise to this industry. And I've worked with practically every industry there is, <laughs> honestly. And the, you know, the vibe in this industry is really, really special. Um, and I think that's why people become so passionate about it why, once they get into the work. It's not just the work. It's sort of the, the feeling of the industry overall. Um, we are talking about is a job or, you know, an increase in sales or whatever those sorts of things are. But I feel that the opportunity you sense in the tech industry is about a wide open field, you know, that it isn't set in stone where you can be or where the industry is even going, that there is just this openness of where, you know, a great idea can rise. It doesn't always have to come up through a traditional pathway. Um, so that's, that's what the industry feels like to me. Um, but I guess there's kind of three points that I'd like to make about, you know, what it looks like and what the opportunity is for someone who might be wishing to enter it. Um, the first is really about culture. So this kind of ties back to the feel of it. But <clears throat> I think that the tech industry is somewhat more people focused or employee focused than others have been, 
partially because it's so new in many cases. So if you are someone who is, you know, just 25 and starting your own company, you're going to start from a place of what your needs are rather than, you know, someone who started a company 25 years ago and set things based on the cultural norms of the time. So, you know, it's not to say it is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I do find that uh, the culture to be more people focused. So, you know, there is the, the typical things that we hear about, like, you know, um, you know, fun events happening, flexible workspace, um, you know, uh, things around unlimited vacation time, this kind of thing that we often hear about. But I have noticed that a lot of companies are hard coding some of the things that are very important about culture into their policies and procedures. So, you know, there are things around diversity being coded in, but also things around, you know, like, time you need off, uh, not having to you know, prove why you need that time or that space, whatever. More acceptance of the fact that we are whole humans and not just coming in, you know, not just being people during the hours that we're here to work. Um, the second is about the industry itself, which is that it is growing amazingly right now in this province. One of the benefits of being at TechNL is that I get a bird's eye view of what's happening industry-wide. So if you're in a company, obviously most of your effort is going to be focused on what's happening there and what's happening with you and how are you growing. But when you're in an organization, you get to see how that's happening with everyone. And there have been so many successes and so much investment, private investment from outside the province uh, happening in the province. And that translates into a lot of growth in our companies. So uh, even some folks on this panel today, they're in really high growth companies right now. And that is just part of what's happening with the, the kind of economic side of it, I guess. And what that leads to is talent, uh, which is people. <laughs> and we have a significant talent gap. That means that our companies have identified the number one challenge they are facing right now is actually hiring enough people to continue their growth. So um, that's part of the work that I do, which I won't get into right now, but our focus really is on attracting more people to the sector because they are so desperately needed. You know, right now there's, I don't know, I think there's around 7,000 people employed in the tech sector in the province. But if you expand that to kind of tech enabled work, um, that's much larger. And 92% of our companies right now that we surveyed recently are planning to expand and I know them to be expanding. Um, and even in the last quarter, I don't have numbers for Newfoundland and Labrador, but for Atlantic Canada, there was um, 2,500 net new jobs. So these aren't somebody moving and going to another company or somebody retiring. These are new created jobs. And uh, we need people to fill those roles. So that talent gap is very, very real. Um, and I will say, you know, like it varies obviously, but the average salary uh, in our province is around 75,000 in the tech industry. So these are well-paying jobs. You know, obviously you still have to come in at entry level and all that kind of stuff, but you know, the potential is there. Um, so that whole talent scene is a big thing. And that is what I do all the time. So after this event, anybody wants to go into the booth, get my email, reach out. We have a whole team of people that would love to talk to you about entering our industry. Um, and as a last point, I'll clue up, just to echo something that Sherry said at the beginning, which is that um, we need you in particular. We need women, we need gender diverse folks, we need people of color, we need pe persons uh, with disabilities because we are not diverse enough. Um, you know, it is, this industry is very white, cisgendered male. Um, and we're working to change that. And I think a lot of people, even those white cisgender males are trying their best to make the effort, make the change happen. But uh, I'm a big believer in changing from within so just like all the folks that are on this panel today who are, you know, fighting the fight behind the scenes quietly and sometimes very loudly, thankfully, uh, we need more people inside so that we can get more to come in with us, right? So bring in more people with us. So that's it. I will clue up there. Pass back Thank to Thank you. And you make so many fantastic points to start our conversation here today. You know, um, you know, yeah, the opportunities are just endless and there's so many different types of 
uh, of skills and, and careers and, and ways that we work and technology is a part of everything now. So it's not even just the pure tech uh, companies or jobs, but it's, it's everything is tech enabled pretty much out there now. So uh, I think that's extremely important. And to your point, the, you know, organizations are on this journey now to try to change. They recognize the importance of having these perspectives um, around the table, you know, and I, um, I will throw out there, you know, if you're, a, if you're a woman interested in this, you know, touch base with Carla and her team, touch base with us, and we'll put you in touch with Carla and her team about anything specific uh, in the tech industry, because they're certainly the experts in that area. And if you're an organization or an employer or a leader who's interested in or needs support in moving, you know, forward in your DEI journey, please touch base with us and we'd be happy to support you um, on that. So our next question is for Neve and talking about the differences and opportunities and how many types are out there. I think this is an interesting point now. What does a typical day look like for you in your job? What types of technical and transferable skills do you rely on most when you're working each day? Thank you, Jerry. Um, so yeah, just by way of a quick intro, my name is Neve. I know it's not spelled that way. It doesn't seem like it's spelled that way. It's an Irish name, but it's pronounced like Eve and N. My pronouns are she, her, and I just wanted to take a moment to um, say that I'm delighted to be asked to join the panel and the event today. I wanted to thank the WRDC for inviting me and also just thank my fellow panelists and attendees. It's great to speak alongside some of these other great role models and leaders in the uh, local um, community. And I also look forward to future events with even a more diverse representation. So thank you so much for my acknowledgement at the start. Um, a typical day for me, I should preface this with that, um, I, as Sherry mentioned, I am from Dublin. I did work there for a few years and then I did emigrate to Canada. I was based in Vancouver for a decade. And um, I did find myself in St. John's. I never thought that I'd end up in the most Irish place outside of Ireland after leaving Ireland. But I did come here because I met my partner in Vancouver who's from St. John's and we, we were we relocated here in 2019. Uh, one aspect of my work that's always been a part of my work, even going back when I worked in Dublin, was that there was always some level of remoteness to my work in that, while I was based in an office and was very much predominantly working with a team that was based in those offices, I was involved in either working, in some cases, in a large company that was a, a, a Deloitte, so it's a global company. And particularly in my role back then, I was working on the EMEA team, so Europe, Middle East and Africa. And of course, I was working with a team like all over, including, including North America at one point. So while I was always based in an office and working predominantly with people in person, I was doing um, remote research and calls and remote workshops. Obviously, that has matured a huge amount, particularly since COVID, as we've all, a lot of people have ended up remote working as knowledge workers. Um, but my day, my typical days now are very, very different. Before COVID happened, my typical days were very different to what they would have looked like a few years ago. And now that since COVID has happened, I think a lot of people are possibly in a similar position. So I do work predominantly remotely. My days are very varied. So I can give you an example at the moment in my role. Um, I am self-employed. I do run my own business as a solopreneur and occasionally partner or subcontract to other um, folks. But I am running a small, I would say, boutique consultancy or agency. I, I do have a number of clients. And typically my work involves um, what I would say hands-on work versus sort of advisory level work. And when I say hands-on work, that means I'm actually a practitioner. So I'm going in, I'm augmenting a team, whether I'm, I'm um, helping them ramp up or upskill, or just they, have, they all have the capacity to do something on themselves. I'm an, an additional team member for hire in a way, which is sort of like a retainer in a way, but I don't do that exclusively. Um, it's a little bit more unusual in my situation, but I'm coming in as a researcher or a designer and I'm helping augment a team in a more hands-on way, or I'm helping provide some leadership in their design and their research and their product areas. Versus when I'm more of a consultancy, less hands-on, more advisory, I'm providing a, a more outsider perspective. I'm providing really advice um, to help them scale up, grow their teams, identify new ways of doing things. So for example, in terms of my active clients at the moment, I'm part-time on one project, which is a, lar a very large enterprise level technology company. Uh, I should mention I've signed NDAs, so I typically can't publicly say who they are, but if anyone wants to chat to me privately, I can tell a little bit more about the projects and whatnot. And, 
and when some of these um, products are launched and public, that's when I'm able to talk a bit more about who the clients are. But you can probably kind of guess based on what I'll say who, who they might be. So the current client at the moment is an enterprise level technology company. They are currently one of the highest value tech tech companies globally. They haven't IPO'd yet and they were in the payment space. So I'm working part time with their product team on a new area um, that is very private right now, but they will be launching later this year. And I'm working to help them research and improve the design and the product strategy for that piece. I also part, I'm part-time mentoring um, a, num- a number of designers actually in a telecommunications company uh, based in Canada. Um, so I'm helping really kind of provide some external mentorship to them um, to help them upskill in their own careers and in their roles. And then on the side of that this week, I did, I was recently reached out to by a local company that is a startup that is part of the Genesis Accelerator program that is looking for some external design consultation and leadership support. Uh, so I did write a proposal there last week and I have a follow up with them to walk through that proposal and to sort of discuss where we might take up that, off that project. So um, I'm not sure if that gives a good enough kind of a breakdown of my, my role in my typical day, but in, in summary, my typical day is quite varied. I'm working on a number of projects with a wide variety of clients of which I have active clients and then I have ongoing clients that might need some more advisory level support um, on a more part-time basis. Um, Very quickly, I do user research. So what that means is I really talk to customers and users. I look at how they're using products. I observe their behavior. Um, I listen to what they're saying, but not just what their feedback is, but also kind of their usage of products. And I communicate those insights and those findings uh, along with a variety of other data points back to my clients to help them make decisions. Okay, I, I, I do, um, I'm not so much as, I, when we say designer, people have different interpretations of what, what that means. I do provide more, I, I was a designer, I have done a lot of design in the past. I don't tend to do as much hands-on design execution anymore, but I certainly jump in and get my hands dirty when needed. I work with a design team. I'm more so providing that kind of creative direction or that, you know, leadership to designers and or helping them talk through ideas and like we're chopping with them to kind of get them to a design direction. And um, yeah, that, I think that answers the first part of the question. The second part of the question, Sherry, um, around, apologies, I'm gonna look at it now. Technical and transferable skills I rely on most in performing my job duties. So people do, I do get people saying, oh, you're a techie, you have a very technical job. And I actually don't consider myself to be very technical. Um, certainly in my background, knowledge, um, education, and experience, I did, one of my first roles was a website designer, a website developer. So I was doing front end development. So that was with HTML, CSS. There was a little bit of a back end element to it. Certainly in my job, even now, I have to of course have a level of technical knowledge so that I understand constraints and restrictions. I'm able to speak the same language. I, I work with developers, of course, and product managers and engineering teams, but I am not a technical role. Um, the, I, while, I, while I have a specialist role to a certain extent in that I work in user experience, design, research and product strategy, honestly, the most transferable skills that I rely on are communication skills. Um, I would say particularly obviously being able to speak, listening is very important. I have to do a lot of listening in my job. Writing is very important. Um, I would say because I'm a user researcher, I'm talking to a wide variety of people sometimes from different cultures and from different con- countries. Um, I think facilitation is a very important uh, skill. I think um, analysis, so synthesis, uh, synthesizing information and analyzing information, so those sort of logical skills are very important. Uh, so I'm kind of putting aside a lot of what I would describe the more technical skills, use of tools, design, specialist skills. I actually feel there's a huge amount of transferable skills that people could bring from other industries or other jobs that they've had to be able to then apply and get these type of jobs in the tech industry in general. I do think um, just in the spirit of this event as well around diversity and inclusion, in my area of work, user experience, there's been a huge amount of emphasis around having empathy in the past, like in recent years. And that has really become much more prevalent now as well in, in it's just in general, kind of across the board, particularly when we're talking about you know, empathy for other folks, um, colleagues, um, you know, underrepresented people. The only thing I wanted to mention about that is particularly I've noticed in my uh, area, it can be a very overused term. So I think, you know, just being able to be aware and acknowledge that 
oftentimes we can overestimate our ability to empathize. And it's not just about kind of thinking we have empathy, but it's actually been able to really, it's very important to involve people and listen and learn from those folks and be self-aware continuously to challenge our own biases. Um, one thing in my area of work is we have to be very conscious of including um, people that maybe, for example, aren't necessarily taught of. So I know some of my fellow panelists have already called out the fact that the tech industry here and in general is very white and cisgender male. I have certainly, and while I am very optimistic and I think it's a great industry to, to, to be in and there's a lot of positivity, there has been a number, many occasions in, in, in the past, in fact, where I can think of where I have been in a meeting that's been predominantly male and we're talking about a product or service where, you know, where I'll give you a quick idea. Um, there was a, a CEO mentioned once, oh, um, this isn't, uh, oh, I want, I want the product, I want your mom to be able to use this product. Your mom should be able to use this product. As in, it should be really simple and actually was sort of, it really didn't land well with me at all. And I just want to kind of call that out because, um, first of all, I, I do remember, I didn't say it at the time because I wasn't empowered to and it probably wasn't appropriate at my level or in that job. But I, I remember afterwards in hindsight saying, actually, you know what? My mom is the most tech savvy person in our household and she actually does pretty much have control of the budget <laughs> in a way. So like I didn't, res I didn't respect the fact that the mom was viewed, was viewed as somebody who wasn't tech savvy or like, you know, it's just, oh, she should be easy enough for the mother to use. So I, there is a, like, you know, I'm sorry, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but there is um, this term in, t in the tech industry around use cases and the edge cases. And I remember specifically in that meeting, we were talking about edge cases. Like, oh, no, we don't need to think about this person. We don't need to like design or build a product for this person because they're an edge case. But they're human people, and they probably will need to potentially use this product in the future. So we do need to consider them in who we are designing and building for. Um, one other really quick thing before I wrap up my question is something that um, Carla mentioned, in fact, about right, how she considers herself not to be young in this industry. I think another topic of kind of diversity and inclusion that is very relevant in tech is ageism. And I myself, I'm in my 40s now, and I definitely am conscious that, like, oh, my goodness, like I'm kind of getting old in the tech industry. And in fact, like, that's actually not right at all, if you think about it. Um, there was an article, I will share it in the chat when I pull it up, about, um, I think it was a Forbes article, and it was 50 women over 50. And I really want to make kind of also speak to that today because there are, particularly if we're talking about like career changes and we're trying to encourage more people to get involved in technology in the province, there are so many um, people who have great skills in other areas that are again transferable and that shouldn't think that because they're not young um, that they can't work in this industry. There's a, a wide variety of maturity, wisdom, experiences that anybody, anybody can bring. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I, I just don't think that anybody should be disencouraged um, from not participating. Thank you. My goodness, Neve, you've given me so much <laughs> to think about and reflect on, but you've brought so, so many fantastic points. I mean, one of the things is how we, we think of tech careers as being someone sat down with them in their computer and they're just coding and they're doing these things. A lot of people kind of have that view of a tech, of a job in tech and, and your experience and examples and in your conversation talked about that, you know, a completely different experience. I mean, the work and the work with, uh, you know, in, in so many various roles, uh, it being global, the ability to be flexible and remote and work for multiple or with multiple groups with different things each day all the transferable skills aspects, um, all sorts of things, I think, for us to take away um, and think about with that. And of course, some very relevant and well-taken points around, um, you know, around that the tech industry really, you know, I think that there's places there for everyone and, you know, or just about everyone in terms of what they can bring um, and the importance of every, of all these different perspectives around the development of products and services and technologies that we use or else they don't work for everyone, right? Um, and as you say, we're all people and, and it's usually meant for all of us. Um, so I'm going to switch over a little bit to a little bit of a different uh, area. And then my next question is for Anna Gray. Um, what support does the Genesis Center provide women interested in launching their own business in the tech sector? 
Yeah, so we run a women in tech peer group. This is for women who are working in the tech sector, who have founded their own tech companies or are thinking about founding their own tech companies. Um, I'll drop some links in the chat uh, to join the mail list for that. We also run a series of programs all the way from starting to scaling your tech business. So most of our clients start with our evolution program. We run that three times a year and that allows people to kind of validate an idea they have for a tech business and see if they want to go all in on it. So I'd encourage anyone, uh, women especially, who have a tech business idea, I will share the links for those two programs, but we've had a huge increase in women founders all across our programs. So it's a really exciting time to start a tech business and uh, we'd love to help you with that, so. Fabulous. And shifting, yeah, so I, I, I mean, I think it's really important to note that, that if you are a woman out there, you have ideas around these things or you just really don't know where to start, there are lots of um, uh, supports with the Genesis Center. You can touch base with Tech and Nell or with WRDC, and we'll put you in touch with Anna Gray and with the people who can really talk through and support um, support your journey um, if you're interested in exploring those options in this area. And we've seen what's happened with some of the successes um, that have come about in the tech sector recently. It's so exciting. Um, so many great companies are, are doing so well uh, here. Um, Mandy, Mandy's next on our list. Uh, if we have people listening today who have experience or education in non-technical fields, what would you say to them who might be considering changing their career trajectory to one in tech? Awesome question. <laughs> and obviously one very near and dear to me based on what you heard in my intro. Um, I think, well, I just want to put a shout out in the last question to Bounce Health Innovation as well. Sherry, when you listed the other organizations, if you're in health tech, that's another support organization that's also very focused on um, encouraging more diverse founders in the health tech space. So in terms of considering a career switch, I think there's a couple of things. I really appreciate um, what Neve mentioned about ageism. I think age is not a factor at all in that switch. And I think transferable skills um, exist in every single industry. So I have not met a single person ever who wouldn't be a fit for a career in tech. Not one. Um, I loved that part of Megan's intro was that she was neurodiverse and, and as are some of the rest of us, me included. Um, and I think there are a, a, an amazing breadth of types of roles in this industry that can be a fit for you depending on what you're looking for. So if you find it easier to work remotely, that's one of the advantages to a lot of careers in this industry. If you find it easier to work not a typical nine to five based on your needs, there are a lot of opportunities in this industry for, the, for folks um, who find it easier not to work that schedule. One of the things, so at Virtual Marine, um, we're hiring, so check out, check out the website if you're looking for a job, um, that we do is, uh, it's very much a family focused business. It's 17 years old and we're about 25 people, but when you look at the types of um, opportunities there, it's something I had never quite seen before, mostly white male cisgendered folks, but the family focus means that we actually have a number of men who leave work to pick their children up from school when school ends. It's something I haven't experienced before, and then they finish their day at home or they come early or whatever works for them. But to see them get up in the middle of the day and leave at two o'clock to go pick their children up is like the most wonderful thing. Um, so I think those are some of the advantages of, you know, being a non-technical person who is looking at a switch. So when you think about skills, I think you've listed a lot of them. I think empathy is core right now to most every um, role in tech no matter what you're doing, it's really important because whatever company you're in, you're creating something, whether it's a service or a product for humans. Um, and I think those those skills are really important. I think writing skills, so when we look at, at Megan, for example, is a great writer, those skills are hugely transferable and hugely missing in a lot of technical roles, but are very important. 
Um, I'm a big advocate for people from arts in tech. I think it's really, really important for people to understand that their skills as artists or in art space backgrounds are exceptionally transferable. Generally, um, they're quite observant. Uh, they have really strong abilities to um, communicate or translate information in different ways. And again, this is a generalization, but when we look at people that come from non-technical education or experience backgrounds, they bring a really great perspective um, that's more personal and more focused on the user of that product or service than most uh, that come from a technical background do. In terms of the switch itself, I think you, you know, we've listed a whole bunch. So between WRDC, Genesis, TechNL, um, Bounce, even Business and Arts NL, there are a lot of organizations out there to help people understand what their opportunities are, as well as folks like, you know, all my fellow panelists who I'm not going to volunteer them, but I know from experience have been very open to talking to people about that switch and what that looks like and what opportunities there are for them, because I think it's important to find your place. And so for me, switching careers as someone with um, ADHD and someone who has had different passions that kind of all come together, it's been really important to be able to kind of make switches and having that support of a mentor or a colleague or a friend who, who gets it. Um, traditionally, especially again, as, as a woman in her 40s, um, who came out of university at a time when jobs were very scarce in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I think the kind of concept of working in one job for your whole career that had a good pension, that was consistent and reliable and secure was very important. We know now that no job is secure. Um, no job is guaranteed to be there in the future. And so looking at it from as a, what do you call an older person, but even for someone in their 60s or someone in their 70s who wishes to continue to work, um, being open to the fact that jobs are changing, work is changing, and those opportunities are there are, are really important. And I think really just leaning on the potential mentors and organizations that are there to support you and knowing that whatever skills you have in your job, they are transferable in a way that will fit in a role in this industry. Fabulous, absolutely. And again, so many great points and things to take away uh, from the conversation. You know, how, how artists and people, you know, who would consider themselves to be artists and creative may never picture themselves um, in this industry and, you know, outside of graphic design or something like that, if they're a little bit technical, right? But that, that's not the case at all. And, and um, you know, how that fits in and how important it is um, in this industry. Um, the, the, the progressive and flexible working arrangements that can help meet a variety of needs for a variety of people um, is a huge benefit um, for people. Um, and the importance of mentorship, as you say, Manny, particularly for people who are switching. Uh, I think, you know, I think it's important for everyone if they're exploring a new area or they're, you know, kind of you know, changing gears in terms of how they're going to work with a career path or even just as they're starting on a path that maybe they've been working on forever. Um, those mentors, and I'll always throw in with that, that I believe in role models. I believe in mentors, but I think sponsors are also extremely important. Um, you know, it's important for us to see others like ourselves who are in roles so that we can relate to that and identify that we, you know, we can see ourselves being successful there. Then the mentors to have those conversations and those great, uh, you know, relationships where we both benefit and we can, you know, learn and move forward. But having sponsors internal who really help to push the dial and get, you know, ensure we have opportunities and equal access to opportunities and help to promote us within some of these places where there are systemic um, issues that we may not be, you know, recognized in the same way otherwise is definitely important too, especially from an advancement, to, I would say, perspective for women in the sector. So just to raise that as well. So lots of fabulous. Yes. <laughs> jump back in for one second with that point exactly. Um, um, Neve's example of like, not feeling or not being at a particular place to be able to speak up is really important, I think, because 
if you're in a role where you've traditionally done one thing and you're interested in moving, even within your organization, um, hopefully you have support of sponsorship there, whether it's through your manager or um, a senior leader in your organization. But speaking up because, as we know, um, most people aren't mind readers and see you in this role. And if you see an opportunity for yourself, I think it's important to be able to advocate for yourself and find that person who's going to be your sponsor um, to kind of help pull you up or sideways into something different. And if they're not open to it, know that it's okay to explore things elsewhere while keeping, you know, the, the security of your existing role. Um, but being open and honest about what's working for you and what's not working for you at work is something that traditionally as women, um, as, a, as a generalization, we're not particularly good at, right? We're good at like solving the problems and, you know, keep staying small or quiet and um, just doing what needs to be done and what's expected of us. And so I think the importance of being able to speak up and finding someone who's actually a sponsor as opposed to necessarily a mentor who can help you figure out, you know, I'm not particularly satisfied in my current role, but I see a thing over there I'm interested in, is there an opportunity? Absolutely, having those conversations for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, very important point. So my next question is for Megan. What opportunities do you see in tech for people without a technical background? Thank you. Um, so there's already been lots of great points made around this, um, this question. Uh, so I'm going to try and speak to stuff that hasn't already been mentioned. Um, and particularly, you know, I'm going to speak about my experience um, personally and, you know, collab um, because that's where I work. Um, but uh, it, I mean, the short answer is that there are endless opportunities for someone without a technical background. Um, I think that that's already probably evident just based on everything everyone else has already said today. Um, but uh, I guess first, uh, I'm going to use terms that I don't love, but hard skills and soft skills. Don't love that distinction, but that's another another conversation for another day. Um, and so I think when we talk about technical things, we're often talking about hard skills. So the first part of answering this question is to say, like, what does it mean to have a technical background? Because hard skills are something that you can, um, you can go and get uh, if you don't have them. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm speaking in our audience here to sort of knowing there may be people who are still about to start their, their journey into like their education and career path. And there's people who might be couple decades into it or, or more and, and whatnot. So um, everyone's going to be different in terms of whether they want to go back and do more education or training. But if you are someone who doesn't have certain technical skills, you can always go and get them. Uh, we have a, a developer on our team who is incredible. She's actually really, really good. Um, and she didn't switch into development until her 30s. So she was, you know, a late career change and she went back and got those technical skills. Um, and everything she did before that informs her work now. Um, so I would say if you're if you're thinking about tech and you don't have a technical background, um, I would say don't let that box you in. Um, you can certainly pursue technical roles. But um, the flip side of that is that you don't have to have a technical background or be a technical person or work in a technical role. Um, and I had our team check the numbers for me. Um, so we have 83 people at Colab now and 42, per, 42 of those people are in technical roles. So that's about half. That means half the company is in non-technical roles. So there is huge opportunity and if you want to look at those non-technical roles, the, the experience and education that all those people have um, on, on that side of the business are, are, are very varied. Um, and, you know, our head of design, his background is um, he did a, a degree in, in philosophy and political science. You know, we're talking a lot about arts, but I want to acknowledge the arts and humanities programs that are not writing and 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 visual art but you know you can go and, and do philosophy or political science and still come and have a career in tech there's there's no background as i love what mandy said um 
I've never met anyone who's not suited for tech. There's no background that precludes you from this industry. Uh, I had a, uh, a friend years ago who had done a Bachelor of Education and was subbing lots and didn't have a full-time teacher role and sort of casually asked me, you know, like, can you do anything else with a Bachelor of Education? And it was a very honest question. I went, oh my gosh, you can do anything with a Bachelor of Education. But, you know, that's, even that is a, is a, is a pathway into tech because, to, you know, we talk about arts and business, but like you could have a BED and be someone who's a teacher um, and the training and, you know, so roles in customer success, that's a really great background to take into that area of tech. Um, and I think a lot of people have alluded to this or mentioned this outright, but it, it, it is about people. And so, you know, having those non-technical backgrounds is really important. You can build the best software in the world or the best piece of tech in the world. It doesn't matter if no one adopts it. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if no one finds out about it um, because you need those people who can communicate the value of your software, um, who can get you in front of people who need to know about you, who can be there to support customers through, um, through adopting the software, through learning how to use it. And um, as, as Neve mentioned, you know, doing that research and understanding and listening, those are all really important things. So um, I feel like I had another point that I'm missing, but you know, um, what opportunities are there? I think it really, what I would say is it depends on what do you wanna do? Cause to, like Carla said, tech really is this open field and anything, anything you can think of, um, there's gonna be a job opportunity for you in tech. And so it's just about getting comfortable with that idea of, um, working for a tech company uh, doesn't doesn't mean that you have to be self-identified as a tech person. Um, I certainly don't. Um, I have friends who call me a, a luddite. They're they're joking around, but um, I'm not someone who loves to keep up with the latest in tech. When my apps update, I don't read the updates. I just say okay, thanks, and I <laughs> I use technology. But I'm not someone who that's my passion. Um, but in my job at a tech company, what I am passionate about is our audience and and helping, you know, our team um, get our work in front of the right people and, and finding our audience and helping them, you know, from a content point of view. So um, I think that's that, what opportunities are there. That, I mean, the, there's, there's endless opportunities and um, sometimes it just takes stepping back and thinking, okay, what do I want to do? And, and tech might be the place for you to do it, but you know, there's um, yet there, there's just so many different types of companies that it's it's almost hard to say, oh, here go down this avenue because it's going to depend on you and what and what your interests are and what you care about. But um, yeah, I would say it's like it is. You can build your own career path completely. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you, Megan. I find it extremely um, interesting. I think this is um, the first tech focused maybe conversation I've had where the words human and people have been the focus of so much of what we've talked about, not, not the technology, the, the, the products, the, I don't know, machinery almost like, it's like we have this whole different and our focus today is so, you know, I think that shift has been happening, but I think it's the first kind of conversation or in the tech focused um a venture place that it's it's so much of the focus everyone you know and we know how important that is and we know that's why you know one of the reasons why gender balance and diversity in tech is so important is is because it is all being created for for people for for our world um so my next question is for carla what skills training experience and personal characteristics do you feel are high priority for tech companies so we're kind of doing a little switch uh, where you know we're going from talking about what do you feel a non-technical people can kind of bring to what are tech companies looking for Carla and what, what are you seeing out there what roles are those tech companies recruiting for right now so in terms of the skills um they while we are taking the switch now looking at it from the employer side uh, they are very much the things that we have spoken about here today um the world economic forum did a skills listing for you know jobs of tomorrow kind of thing but they're talking about you know 20 
2024, 2025, not 50 years in the future. And I don't know, I think there was maybe 20 job skills on there and maybe five of them were pure, you know, hard skills, like Megan said, uh, but the others were analytical thinking, um, complex problem solving, uh, leadership and social influence. And that is exactly what our companies are looking for. Um, you know, one, what I like to say about job ads is that job ads are wish lists. And job ads are the first barrier to working in our industry, right? So I know WRDC does lots of work around this and everybody on this panel has certainly talked to employers about like, you know, at the very minimum, run your job ad through one of those, you know, gender analysis kind of uh, engines that we have out there. But a job ad is a wish list. But if you pair out the technical skills, what you will see is that they are looking for people who can solve problems, who um, you know are flexible in terms of how they deal with stress and change in the workplace. That's really important in tech because things move very fast. Um, you know, it's not just internally in that a discovery can be made and you're off down a new path, but it's, you know, you just got an investment, you're unlocking a new audience or a competitor just came into the market, you need to pivot. These things happen very fast. So flexibility um, and was mentioned earlier about like emotional intelligence, empathy. That goes back not only to being a good employee, but also to being able to give your employer insights that they can turn into business leverage, right? So uh, Neve made the example of, you know, we want uh, your mom to be able to use this. Well, having someone who is a mom in the room who has that perspective, you might be able to lift something up that, you know, will change the trajectory of a company. So these things, I agree with Megan, that they shouldn't be referred to as soft skills. I've, I've started myself referring to them as, at the very minimum, personal skills, but generally I refer to them as leadership skills, because to me, that's what those things translate into. So um, in terms of the roles, uh, the industry echoes kind of what Megan said about CoLab. I had did a little analysis a couple of months back. I actually just used TechNL's job board as, you know, sort of a sample set and broke all the jobs that were on there at the time, and there was about 100, into, you know, business side uh, and technical side, and they were about half and half. Um, the reason you see a lot of emphasis on the technical roles, like software developers and things like that, is because they aren't as transferable, right? Like those aren't skills that if you were a marketer, yeah, you can transfer that into programming like without in, in between, you have to go get those skills. Um, so when we think about what the roles that are being hired for, we see a lot of software developers, engineers, you know, data analysts all on sort of the technical side. And then on the other side, we see a lot of sales and marketing, business development, customer success roles, um, research, digital marketing is a big piece right now. So we do see that sort of balance. Um, and I think the key when we are looking at what are the roles that people are hiring for is the translation. So Mandy talked a lot about like what transferable skills are, but you actually have to translate them. That's kind of the funny thing. So one thing that our team does is work with people who are trying to get jobs in the tech industry directly. And so they will, you know, say, I'm trying to get this job. Here's my resume. And, uh, you know, there was an example recently of someone who had been in sort of the manufacturing industry, was trying to move over into tech. And the role that he had had was exactly the same as the one in the tech company he was looking at, but they called it two different things. You know, he had called it like, uh, I don't know, like uh, chain analysis or something like supply chain analysis. And over here, it was like product management and whatnot. So when you get to that job ad, you need to first tell yourself, I don't have to have 100% of these uh, asks. Women especially need to tell themselves this. And then you need to look at what they're asking and you need to translate it into words you are familiar with. And then you need to take your resume and translate it back into their language, right? So, you know, you'll see things about like, uh, you know, um, if you see the term agile 
like in a software development company. That's just a system of moving things around. So you're going to Google that. You're going to see, oh, they want someone who's experienced with agile. Well, I don't, I didn't do agile training, but I actually worked in, you know, a lean startup where these things happen. So you're going to be able to translate those things over. That's a really important piece that I think doesn't get talked enough about. It's actually, it's not just transferable skills. It's that you have to do the work of translating them into the language that tech companies use. Um, and just to clue up a couple of examples of like how this can happen. Um, you know, I think that there's many people, especially women uh, who are trying to re-enter the workforce. Maybe, maybe you were home with kids, something like that, or maybe you just whatever, you know, say you did an accounting diploma. Um, maybe you don't want to go into an accounting role, but what is the foundation of often accounting is data analysts right? Or data analysis, sorry. And that is something that the tech industry needs a lot. You know, you did a poli sci degree uh, or philosophy degree. You know, you are very, very good at taking large reams of information and breaking it down into simple, concise facts. To me, that talks marketing, that talks business development, all sorts of things. Um, and writers, of course, we love our writers. I started as a writer. I'm still a writer. Content is still king, even though, you know, things are changing. Everywhere you go, you're going to have to be on message and, and talking about those things. So being able to translate those skills over is, is really good. But yeah, so just to quickly summarize, they're looking for all the jobs. <laughs> you know, uh, CoLab, as an example, I think planned on hiring 100 people over the next, like last year and this year coming up. And they need everybody. So don't rule yourself out and, you know, just look at those job as, as wish lists and try to see yourself within those terms. And if you need a little help with it, reach out to people like my team, folks at WRDC, anybody will help you kind of translate those skills. Fabulous. And thanks, Carl. I noticed you actually just answered a question that had popped up in the chat at the same time. Someone was asking if there were services to help in the translation of those resumes. And yes, absolutely. WRDC, uh, Tech and Nails, contact us, contact Carla and her team, um, and we'd be happy um, to help with those. Um, so our next question uh, here is for Neve. So Neve, you are involved with WRDC STEM for Girls program as a role model, and you recently joined the board of directors. Uh, tell us why supporting girls and women is important to you. Uh, what's the benefit of finding role models or mentors as people explore a career in tech? And how can, you know, women and or, you know, and young women and gender diverse people who may be participating today or who are attending today, how can they find mentors and role models? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for me, why supporting others is important. Um, it goes back to my own experiences. So I definitely um, I'm very appreciative of help that I have received in the past. Um, particularly as somebody that you know is an immigrant, when I did move to Vancouver in 2009, um, I think I was I was younger and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and you know in hindsight probably a little bit naive. Um, I had never been to Vancouver; I'd never even visited there before. So I literally arrived with a suitcase and thought to myself, "Okay, well, you know, I have this good education from Dublin and a couple of years of work experience. Yeah, I'll get a, pro a job, no problem." And it was proved to be a little bit harder than I thought when I first arrived. Um, just the reality of the, the job market in that city and, you know, a different kind of employment culture in Canada. Um, there's a hidden job market, of course, you know, of people that you, you know, you, you need to have connections, you need to have a network. Um, so I do, I'm very appreciative and I do still, I'm still in touch with the folks that um, I reached out to. I had to put myself out there. So definitely networking was very important, but I did put myself out there. And I, I do still recall, and I'm still in touch with people that did connect me to other people and did suggest me for opportunities which led to me getting my first contract um, in Vancouver, and which in fact is, uh, that company is still a client of mine, not active right now, but I, I worked with them as recently as um, two years ago. And um, in fact, one of the people in the company separately is a, a leadership coach for me right now. So what I'll say is that it is a little bit harder finding mentors. I mean, there's definitely a lot more role models. It's very positive to see this panel here today, for example. Um, which I feel like I'm going back to Carla's point about us feeling a little bit older, I'm kind of aging myself, but I didn't have that level of representation or visibility myself when I was younger. Um, 
I do, I, I, again, I don't want to be sort of putting any negative slants on things and things are like greatly improved. But I do recall like when I was sort of a young woman in tech in Dublin, often being the only woman or one of few women in the room. And like I went to a networking event, I just felt completely like out of my depth and like not welcomed there, to be honest. Tried to kind of strike a conversation with a group of guys and just felt really like, why are you, trying, why are you talking to us? So I think I, what I do want to say is it's a great opportunity. It's a great industry to be in. Um, one of the skills I do think is required of everybody uh, in any sort of industry is one of perseverance and grit. And if you are um, not finding your way in easily to certain areas, like to keep trying and to find that group of people that are supportive and that are encouraging that will help you. Um, as many people have helped me, um, you know, in Vancouver and in that occasion, some in Dublin, uh, some in St. John's, as many as there have been as many people that have been friendly and helpful. There are also people that have just like completely ignored me or dismissed me or have been unhelpful. So I think just you have to find the right people and you have to find people that like understand the value. Uh, in addition to like what Carla said around communicating the value that you bring, you also have to find people that understand that value and can see potential and that will support and help you. Not just as um, Cherry mentioned, not just as connectors or mentors, but also as sponsors. Like, you know, I worked on a, pro a, pro a project actually, which is um, a mentorship platform. And as much as people need mentorship, because there's a lot of talk about, oh, women, we need, we need to mentor women, blah, 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 blah. Women need to step up. There was this book, a very popular book years ago called Lean In, which also never fully sat right with me because it's all about women need to step up and we need to lean in and we need to be more, act like more typical male traits. And I was like, actually, hang on a second. Maybe men need to step back. And like, you know, maybe they need to help pull us up. So one thing I, before I go on a rant, one thing I would like to see, even with this event, um, and I know there are some male attendees, but like locally, I'm kind of questioning, why aren't there more of the leaders uh, in the St. John's lo uh, local tech ecosystem that are male, cisgender, white CEOs? Why aren't they participating in this, in this event, for example? Um, I'd love to see more of them attending. Um, getting back to your question. Um, it has been important for me to have mentors because they have provided me with network uh, connections, opportunities. A lot of the mentors that I've had, I have found unofficially through my work. So there are people that I have, have been more senior to me in roles or in projects that I have looked up to and I've observed how they've handled situations. And I've sort of learned by doing. So things that I look and I observe in terms of how they have communicated things or present, made presentations or worked with their team, I aspire to be like them. Um, on the flip side of things, I've also observed some folks that are maybe have bad management practices that I've taken that on board myself. Like, I don't want to be a leader like that in the future. Um, I did, I actually just recalled when I did make my application to the WRDC and what I put in my um, expression of interest, and it was that I did get to, uh, the opportunity to attend an event in Vancouver in 2015, and it was a women in leadership event. Uh, conference in which Gina Davis did give the keynote speak speaking uh, keynote conference and um, talk at that, and she has that organization that she heads up C Jane it's called. It's the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media, and her speech really did make that lasting impression with me. Um, the whole tagline around that organization is "If she can see it, she can be it." So certainly, obviously, in media, um, you know, art copying real life, real life copying art. It is great to see more representation in film and media and whatnot fictionally, but then of course, making sure that women that are in leadership positions and in, in any leadership positions, but also in technology are being more promoted and are more visible. I do think that there is still, there is, it's the reality of the industry. It is still a bit of a bias towards, um, there are women in leadership positions. There are women in tech companies. It's just simply not enough that, oh, all of a sudden we have, we have 20 percent females in our organization. Of course, that's great that you're increasing um, you know, numbers in your organization. You have more women than you did a year ago or a few years ago. But I really want to call out that it is a journey. And as much as you have increased hiring of women, you really need to um, make sure that you are retaining those women, training those women and not just hiring them into your company, but also looking at your board of directors, your investors, and making sure that there are paths to leadership for those women, or that you're also uh, actively uh, trying to source people that are certain for those positions. Because I've heard too many times that there's a pipeline issue, or oh, there's, not, there's not enough women in this industry, there's not enough pools to, to um, search from. And that's a cop out as far as I'm concerned, that there's plenty of data out there that proves that. Um, I also, the reality is, certainly in the organizations I've worked in, 
there are often women that are in positions, leadership positions in, for example, HR, marketing. So the more traditionally female um, areas, there's a lot less women leaders. Um, it's improving, but there are a lot less women leaders in areas such as engineering and development, design, product. And I think that's something that I would like to see more um, women also have those opportunities um, through mentorship and sponsorship uh, in the future too. That's fabulous. Thank you, Neve. You raise a lot of, uh, of really good points. Um, a couple of things I'd like to point out, I guess, uh, with that or, or, or comment on as well. Um, one, just so that I don't forget, um, is that, you know, if there are any uh, young women or women or gender diverse um, individuals who are attending and they would like to see more stories about women who are working in these areas, um, our STEM for Girls website has um, all kinds of role models in there. If you are a panelist here, you're not on there, come connect with us, get involved. Um, you can be involved as much or as little um, as you know you may be able or, or would like to. And uh, Neve is, is one of the people who are who are in, in that uh, group. I think there's almost a hundred. Uh, now uh, in there and it's growing every day. So I'll just mention that uh, as a great resource on that side and to hear about a variety of careers. Um, but Neve, you raise a really good point. And I mean, we can't shy away from the fact that the tech industry is one of the industries where, where there is not gender balance, where women and other groups are certainly underrepresented. Um, and, you know, and it, it has not historically and continues at this point, we're still not where we need to be in terms of it being a truly inclusive work environment. And as someone who works with employers every day about this stuff, I'd say there's not many that are <laughs> at this point. So I don't think that, uh, you know, those leaders and those organizations need to feel exceptionally different about that. I think that most companies, organizations, the business, the whole system was set up, uh, you know, historically to be, to have those systemic issues uh, for, for particularly various underrepresented groups in the area. And it's very important to note that it is an ongoing journey. This is continuous work. You don't do training. You don't do respectful workplace training and everything is fixed. Um, yes, education and awareness is a part of it, but so too is, you know, um, uh, assessment of your own environment and, and, you know, putting things to action, having your leadership on all those pieces that are really important. Um, and I will point out again that if you are one of those leaders who are attending here today, you know, and you do want support in that area, please reach out to us. Um, and the other point I think is really important. I know Lean In never fully sat with me either. Um, along with some others, I think that it was a part of a journey, you know, I think that that is all a part of the journey. And there's two sides, there's the what do we do in the meantime, until we get where we want to go, um, as well as how do we get where we want to go. And, um, you know, WRDC had a speaker last year for one of our events, Michelle King. Um, and when I saw her work around and, and her main thing was around fixed workplaces, not women. Um, and I think that that's a really important point to put out here too, that it's not that the women need to be fixed. It's, it's, it's the work, you know, places and, and the industries that we need to fix to be more inclusive, to invite these perspectives and all people to be a part of the conversation and the development of these products and services and things that we know are so important for our world. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll shift off before I get too much into <laughs> my, uh, my uh, platform for that piece. But thank you so much for all the points you brought up, Neve, there. And Anna Gray, so it's interesting because we're talking about misconceptions or we're talking about perceptions about things here. Um, what are some of the misconceptions that you think hold people back from pursuing entrepreneurship in tech? I mean, that's another whole whole piece of the uh, of the puzzle. Yeah, I might need another couple hours for this, and I'm sure uh, Mandy and Neve can weigh, on, weigh in on this too. Um, I've thought a lot about this. Um, one of the more straightforward answers is I think um, as much as there's pressure for people feeling like they have to come from a technical background to work in tech, that feeling is almost tenfold when you talk about starting a tech company. And that's a total misconception. Um, founders of great tech companies come from all backgrounds, all life experiences, all stages of their lives. Um, so I would say that, you know, you just need to understand the problem you're trying to solve and your customers very well in order to start a tech company. So you're trying to 
solve a problem with technology. You don't need to be the technology yourself. Um, another answer, I think, is starting your own company is daunting. It's hard. There's no way to sugarcoat that at all. Um, and I think sometimes people feel like they need to be perfect or have a certain kind of personality or a lot of money or this ideal set of life circumstances to start a company. And uh, I think people should feel like they can start a company before they're perfectly ready. This is why we've come up with all these supports and resources to support entrepreneurs so that they can kind of start a company while also perhaps having to balance all the uh, the non-ideal parts of life that come with starting a company. So you can bring your actual real self to starting a company and, and all your life experiences. So I would say that start a company before you're ready. There's support out there. There's a community here in Newfoundland and Labrador that's really rooting for you. So if you're scared, uh, that's understandable, but you should definitely try anyways. So yeah. That's fabulous. Thank you. And guys, some really great um, um, advice there. I think particularly, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the ideas. It's it's the ideas and, and the solution normally to a problem. Not that you have to have necessarily all the answers um, or have a, have it completely developed <laughs> before you come. That's that's part of the part of the development of the, of the uh, uh, of the uh, organization itself or of your of your idea. A question for Mandy next. Um, we know that creating inclusive environments is so important for diverse employees. What are some promising policies and practices that you see that are helping make the tech community more welcoming for women and gender diverse employees? Awesome question. Um, I'm going to continue my let's mess up your role and add to what Anna Gray <laughs> just said briefly. Um, I think I just want to um, doubly emphasize what she said around there's no right time or right circumstance. I think that's the biggest misconception that people have that I need to have all my ducks in a row. I need to have a certain amount of money in the bank or I need to have a certain type of skills or a certain amount of free time um, that really doesn't ever exist. And I think it's you know, it's analogous to a lot of other things that we do in life where we think, okay, I'll, I'll do that when I have these things lined up. And, and those aren't really things. And I think it's important to know those resources that are out there for you, but also that it's really hard and it's not for everyone. I think we over um, celebrate people who start companies and under celebrate the people who build and grow them in a way. So that's a big thing too, that is a, is a myth I always like to bust where it's awesome to be a founder, but also you don't need to be a founder. And sometimes we put that on a, a bit of a pedestal and, and that's not really a thing either. So I think there's so many um, myths that we can all continue to try and bust there, but exactly what Anna Grace said, it's, it, there's no right time or set of circumstances. Um, so in terms of your question around policies and inclusivity, I think if tons of great and great examples and tons of, um, like Neve said, often we learn a lot from the things we don't wanna be and we see the things that we don't want to model in our businesses. So I gave an example in my earlier answer of at Virtual Marine, the flexibility to leave and go pick up children from work is a really great program for all genders and all folks. Um, I think, when we started Common Ground, one of the questions we initially had was, why are the washrooms genders? And until someone raised that, it was not something any of us thought of. It was because we came in to rent a space and that's how they were. I thought, well, it doesn't need to be that way, so we can just switch them over. And so making sure that both uh, existing washrooms had access to all the things anyone would need. So whether it was um, period products, in both bathrooms, it was accessibility, it was safety and security. That was really, really important in creating, creating an inclusive environment, um, but, but for outside influence and questions, then we actually brought in a group of people to say, tell us what else we could be doing to be more inclusive, because we don't know. Um, I worked with a company during the pandemic that what had their first transgender employee and they wanted to really do right by them so making sure they understood uh practices around naming and put the right name on the check that they needed for their bank account but their chosen name on the envelope that the check came in um those things were really really important 
to making that person feel fully able to be themselves at work and uh, creating that inclusive environment that are very small things that cost them nothing except the learning. Um, so brought in a consultant to kind of say, hey, here's what you need to know about language. You know, the whole leadership team was cisgendered male. And they were like, we just, we want to know, and we don't know, and we don't want to mess this up. So I think being open to those kinds of things um, is really, really important. I had the pleasure of being the first entrepreneur in residence at Bounce Health Innovation a few years ago and got to work closely with um, the Memorial Center for Entrepreneurship. And one of the things Florian as a leader emphasized and did there was say, we're not getting enough applica applicants for our work terms or for our Mel Woodward Cup competition that are women or gender diverse individuals. How do we change that? And worked really hard. And now it's the numbers have changed significantly. Again, we're, we're not there, but it's been a huge, huge difference when someone says we're going to put the focus on that and make conscious decisions to change how we phrase our applications, the language we use, how we recruit people, what we structure in our programs. And I think that's a really, really important example of making a conscious choice to make sure our policies and procedures are inclusive. Um, another really great example from my perspective has been how we um, position, again, it comes back to that translation that Carol has said, so the language we use. So when you're hiring, making sure you look at what you put in the job description. Um, sometimes, especially as tech entrepreneurs, we like to use words like um, grit and passion and all kinds of different things that may not resonate with someone who doesn't feel like that's their personality. So making sure we're not just hiring ourselves over and over again. That is exceptionally important. And that's what tends to happen in a lot of tech companies where I want more people like me, um, which is actually a huge detriment to having a successful business and growing your business. Um, I had lunch uh, at a, a little speaker series one time uh, when I was in school in Halifax. And one of the speakers was a VP with Scotiabank Worldwide who talked about at one point recognizing that every single person they were hiring were the, were the same person. They had a commerce degree, they had the same work terms, they had the same volunteer experience, and they were great people and great workers, but they all looked identical, you know, from a big picture. And so what they decided to do was put a cap on commerce hires and required their managers to hire people from other programs. And so they started hiring from music, from science, from arts from poli sci, from education. And the impact that had on their bottom line was that they grew revenue in all those divisions because they had people who thought a bit differently and who brought their whole selves to work in a different way, bringing diverse perspectives and even um, things like that, that we may think are not required. So I know people often are opposed to, um, um, word won't come to me, but like the mandatory numbers of people <laughs> that we need uh, on boards, on management roles, on roles overall. I think um, sometimes it's really necessary to put those numbers in place and to say, I need to set a goal of having representation. Um, you know, a lot of people have talked about understanding your customers as a business. And if as a business, you don't have any representation from those customer groups, Again, you're projecting things like you've said, the, the mom user. We, I hear that all the time, right? It's so easy your mom could use it. Like, who are these moms who are useless? I have never met a useless mother, <laughs> like seriously. So making sure there are people on your teams with um, experience and backgrounds um, that are coming from different unique perspectives. And looking at how we celebrate things at work. I think is really important. Again, we're a fairly traditional culture here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and we tend to just follow the traditional holidays, right? We just celebrated St. Patrick's Day, for example, Orange Men's Day, but we tend to just stick to our kind of old school, you know, Christian calendar in some way. And again, that's not representative of our population, of our workforce. 
And so making conscious efforts to change that, to make sure that you're um, aware and there are so many resources. I'm sure Technel has resources and WRDC. Um, there are consultants out there who are really, really great at what they do and helping you make your policies and procedures more inclusive. And I think if you want to hire um, a, a strong workforce, then you need to start thinking about those things in, in how you um, in how you present your company to your potential workforce. I love um, the comment in the chat, like I'm a tech user, <laughs> but just because you don't understand the tech or need tech support, you are very useful in, you're the person generally, um, as we know generically, women control the household budget, most of the spending, women um, bring so much to the table and how they use things and interact with things that as a customer, we should be understanding that and making decisions based on that. Anyways, talk to you long. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you, Mandy. And Neve, I see that you've raised your hand. You'd like to weigh in on this one? Absolutely. Thanks, yeah, I, I just, thank you so much. Uh, I think that uh, Mandy makes so many good points. Like all the speakers have made, a, made great points, but there was a couple of ideas I wanted to just kind of tag on to some of Mandy's um, comments in that the technology industry, you know, is very much about disruption and innovation. I could have a, I could have a whole other panel series talking about disruption and like move fast and break things about how we shouldn't actually be like that and why those companies have actually caused problems in society and there's an opportunity for the more emerging tech cities such as St John's to take the example of Silicon Valley. Um, I know people that call it Silicon Harbor, which I personally hate, but let's take the good things from that and learn and make it really really great, but also learn from their mistakes and not repeat them, including diversity and inclusion. Um, but there was one point around that disruption and innovation piece, particularly as we're talking about working in tech. And I, I had this, that, that company I mentioned, my first job, my first contract in Vancouver in Canada that I still work with as a client that recently and I'm working with a leadership coach. Their whole area of expertise is around employee experiences. So researching, improving um, and creating great sustainable employee experiences. And I think that's yeah, it's, it's, it's a really big focus in the world in general with this whole COVID, the great resignation, the great reset, the reality of the tech industry being very hot market and very competitive to hire talent at the moment. And the reality is when you create good employee experiences, they lead to great customer experiences. So the companies that are focusing on really understanding, you know, taking a step back, even disrupt, like even just the, like I, I know we spoke a little bit to kind of them, job descriptions to recruitment, even just actually like rethinking that whole process because it is a very traditional process. There are some issues with it, like even in terms of diversity and inclusion and the way job job descriptions are presented, the way you know the pipelines, hiring processes, interviewing. These are all skills people need to constantly work on and evolve, right? But if we are focusing on creating great inclusive employee experiences. Those employees are empowered and working at great full potential and thinking clearly to then create also inclusive, diverse and great customer experiences. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and yeah, thank Mandy for, for some great points you made. Absolutely. No, thank you, Neve. And, and yeah, and I mean, the thing is that we know that inclusive, you know, welcoming inclusive work environments, they're not just for women, they're not just for gender diverse, they're not just for, you know, the any groups who may be underrepresented in that company or industry or sector. Inclusive work environments are good for everyone. They're good for everyone who works there. They're good for the businesses themselves. They're good for the bottom line. They're good for everything. We've got so much research out there now around all of that. Um, and it's really for, for everyone. Um, and I think Mandy also raised a really neat um, and a good point that we kind of didn't, you know, I think we've talked about it a bit, but kind of just to really put it out there, you know, about our biases, about, about that we only know what we know. We can only know what we know. If we haven't learned it or experienced it, then how can we possibly know about it? So, you know, we need to question, we need to listen, we need to bring in others. Um, who can help give us those other perspectives or ideas or thoughts around, you know, at WRDC, we do that all the time. It's a continuous part 
of our ongoing learning, uh, particularly around the other intersectionalities and the, the aspects of women that, that we are not experts in. And, and these things are emerging and changing all the time. So we just all have to be open to learning, I think, continuously about this. And once we do, you know, when we know better, we do better. So, um, you know, it's really important to be open to that learning and then making those changes and that continuous improvement. And it's funny because I think, it, you know, in business, we're used to the idea of continuous continuous improvement. Well, it's the same with DEI initiatives. It's continuous improvement. It's ongoing learning and changing and growing. Um, so a question for Megan. Megan, what are some of the assumptions or myths about working in tech that you'd like to bust? What barriers do you feel still exist in the tech sector that we all need to work towards breaking down? Yeah, um, I feel like we've, you know, touched on a lot of this. So, um, some of the assumptions, uh, there's, there's, I wasn't planning to tell this story, but it's come to me because we've been talking about this. Um, we've referenced a few times this idea of the, like a mom being able to use tech. Um, and to, to give the example of my grandparents, um, my grandmother and grandfather were a big part of my upbringing. And, you know, my grandfather is um, someone who runs his own business, trucking and contracting. And my grandmother um, was a nurse and then she was on school board um, and, she would never call herself a tech person. She would, if you asked her, she would say, I'm horrible with tech. You know, I don't know how to do anything. Um, but, you know, um, my first access to a computer was through my grandmother because in, you know, I think 95, maybe she had a laptop through her role. Um, she was chair of the school board. So she, you know, back then, that was, a, you know, to have your own laptop, that was like pretty early days for that kind of thing. And, you know, she, I don't know how old she would have been in the mid nineties, but um, I would say over 50. And, you know, she, she was using that laptop to do, to do the work she did. Um, and, and from there, uh, I remember when Facebook first came around, grandmother was very, hesitant, did not like it, very scared of Facebook. And now, I mean, I can't post anything um, from my page or from the collab page. And grandma's the first one there commenting, sharing, and, you know, and in, in, she's engaging all the time on, on Facebook and, and doing many other things. You know, um, over the years, many of her kids and grandkids, we've had to write up step-by-step -step instructions on a piece of paper that she tapes beside the computer for certain things she does. But she's done that work. And compare that to my grandfather, to this day, I don't think he could turn on a computer, you know, uh, and, and he's seen as sort of this entrepreneur who's running these businesses, but he, he, can, he can turn the history channel on TV with the satellite remote, and that's about the level that his growth in tech skills has, has reached. So while my grandmother would never call herself a tech person, the amount she's learned and figured out over the years is wild. And so, you know, I referenced earlier, I said, I'm not really a tech person. I, I am and I'm not. Um, I have a friend who's, who's my age, a woman, and it, sometimes I teach her things and I go, oh, maybe I do know more than I think I know. So I think challenging that idea of what it means to be a tech person, because when I get that question, you know, oh, are you someone who's good with tech? I, I, I'm never confident how to answer it because can I code? No. Can I, like, do I build tech? No. But can I use tech? Uh, yeah. And some of it pretty well. So I think there's a lot of different ways that people are tech people or are not tech people or how we engage with tech. It, it's not one monolithic thing. So, um, you know, uh, I guess that's the key assumption or myth there. Like tech, tech is a broad, broad term and it means a lot of things. Um, kind of rel uh, related to that, um, not all tech companies are the same. So I think we do talk about tech companies and I think as an industry, there are some commonalities and general general things that that you know um, it, it is a newer industry in a lot of ways. So there's some trends and, and patterns that you'll see. But um, like any industry, there there's a wide range of companies that fall under the umbrella of tech. So um, being able to discern the culture of uh, of a company and, and to look at a tech company and and understand like what their mission is, who do they serve, what is the culture like there, that's really important to being able to gauge whether you could fit in 
at, at a place. Cause that's ultimately, you know, everyone, I don't mean fit in as in conform, but I mean, feel comfortable. Um, and so being able to assess um, what different companies are doing and, and we have access now to that we've ne unprecedented access. You can go on LinkedIn and you can find people who really work for a company or who used to work for a company and left, which might also be very interesting people to talk to if you're thinking about working somewhere. Um, and you can, you can just directly reach out to them. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of tools at your disposal to, to find out what a company is like. So I would say not all tech companies are the same. Um, and, you know, likewise, there, there, you might even start working in tech and find that the company you're with isn't a good fit. That doesn't mean tech isn't for you. Um, and then I guess the third thing I would say, um, we've kind of alluded to this already, but pigeonholing, you know, women, girls, or non-binary or gender diverse people into certain roles based on who they are. Um, and that's not just about saying, you know, I've talked about being a non-technical background. Um, so, but, so, you know, sometimes people will say, well, companies are, are only hiring women for marketing or HR or things that we've already alluded to. But even within technical roles, um, I've heard this from people on our team. Uh, there's, there's this um, idea that front end is, is more for, for women and girls versus back end developing. And we have a back end developer on our team who is very passionate about the fact that she is a back end developer. And um, I, I, you know, I, I really am a champion of hers because I think it's awesome that she, you know, um, if you, let, she's still a student. So if you're in a computer science um, class and you're doing a group project and you are the only woman in that group, you might be told, well, you're going to do the front end stuff. And she has very much resisted um, being told that, um, you know, that she has to be in that role. Um, so I think recognizing that, um, yeah, like people, there's, there's no roles that are for women or not for women or girls or any person. Um, it's, uh, you know, um, that, that is another myth and an assumption that's out there. And in terms of the barriers um, that exist that we need to all work together, um, it, you know, we can go macro and we can go micro. We've, we've mentioned a lot of them here today. And um, I think that on a macro level, seeing more representation in the leadership um, roles is a really important one. So I'll specifically call that out. But um, it, it goes all the way down to the micro thing. I mean, someone mentioned washrooms. Like that's that's another thing that can be a barrier for people. Um, having a place in your job application process for people to put their pronouns in their job application. Um, there's a lot of little things that can be done and then there's a lot of big things that need to happen. So I think, um, you know, conversations like today are incredibly important. Um, but, you know, the barriers that exist in tech, uh, they're, they're not, they're not specific to tech, you know, we've, we've run into these barriers in other industries. And um, I think that um, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is all of us being open uh, and vulnerable about this. And, you know, not everybody who experiences I'll say discrimination or, or harassment or all of these other negative things is in a, they're not always in a position to speak up, whether you're directly affected or you're just seeing it and it doesn't feel right. Um, but those of us who are able to speak up, um, I think it's really important. And, you know, we've talked today about other people being involved, um, you know, uh, white, white cisgendered men. Uh, our CEO at Colab is, is, it really comes from the top down at our company that it's important to us to have a diverse uh, workforce and to have culture and that 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 allows for those conversations to happen. So I think that companies and people need to create those environments where everyone acknowledges that we're not perfect, um, but we are working on it. And it's something that we have to continuously work on. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a couple of points, a couple of things, Neve, just before I come to you, but a couple of things I'd, uh, you know, add on to that. We, we do know and we, we are doing 
uh, work and support. And there are companies here who are doing work in this area. They are on that journey and they are, you know, they care about it. Um, the leaders care about it. Um, and it's, it's happening. And I think that that is really important to note. You know, we're quick to talk about the other side, but, but that work is happening here. And there are some, you know, some really great things. And I think it's really important to know too, something else that, that you mentioned in the most that really struck me, the idea that you know, work, work and positions are not gendered. We make them that way, right? It, it's our own perceptions of what they are. That work or that position is not gendered in and of itself. It's a, anyone, um, if they have an interest and, and or the skills and abilities to perform that work or do that job, they can. Um, you know, so we need to take away from picturing, you know, only certain types of people doing that work. Uh, Neve, you wanted to add to, to this one? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I feel like that kind of teen person in school <laughs> raising my hand too many times. But um, Megan just made some really great points there um, that I wanted to also piggyback on. Um, she mentioned about culture fit. So that's one of those areas where that was incredibly prevalent in job descriptions for many years in tech. But now that we actually are reflecting and trying to be more inclusive and, you know, evolving and um, disrupting even the job uh, hiring um, process, it's, it's, it's culture fit oftentimes was language for homogenous, like hiring people like us that look like us that are like us and definitely did not um, help or increase diversity, uh, inclusion and representation. I think Megan makes a great point about how it really does need to come top down. So it, it really is the culture that the leadership team set from early on um, to, to embody those values and to really make that conscious effort and I think it's great, obviously startups, they tend to be small, they're nimble, they're growing. It's great to talk about your culture, of course, and have those values from the start. But it's one thing to have a culture when you're a team of 20, 50. It's another thing to scale that effectively when you're getting into the 100s and 500s and 1000s. So really kind of just being, you know, recognizing a privilege that, you know, a lot of, a lot of these founders and CEOs have and some blind spots. And ensuring that you're not expecting women in general, including the women on your team or women in the um, community to fix that, uh, that lack of representation for you. There's been too many times where I have been approached and many of my, my peers and whatnot, where because we are a woman or we're a minority in some way, um, we're almost expected to help fix these issues or be the experts on fixing, fixing those issues. And there is a term around emotional burden, like. That shouldn't be um, on a female employee to take that, or any uh, minority, uh, underrepresented person, to take on that burden in addition to their own job and their role to, of course, anybody can, can I, I would encourage people to um, recommend people for roles and sponsor them for speaking panels and whatnot. But it's it really has to come from the top and has to be a conscious effort in which you actually go and seek out those opportunities, such as the WRDC, attend training, look for external experts, hire a DEI person, if you're at that point in your organization, to look at all this for you, to look at transparency in, in terms of pay grades, uh, equity and inclusion, and not to, um, I, I'll, I'll give a very simple example. I, I do feel like I'm kind of coming across as a real rebel here, but I have in the past publicly called out manals or like, you know, events where I've seen conferences where there's just there's no representation and there should be. And like, you know, not in a, provocative or um, protagonist way, but just to try and kind of help increase representation. And I have had the question shot back to me, oh, well, who would you suggest? Do you know, do you know a woman you suggest? And while I may do know that, or may know um, some, uh, you know, somebody that I would love to recommend that is a underrepresented minority, it's really up to the organizers or to the, the people leading those events or the companies to, to do that work themselves um, or to pay and hire people that will do it for them. Another point Megan made that I really wanted to also um, just expand on is when she talked about uh, those of us, including many of us on this panel, that have a background that is not exclusively very tech focused. So when we talk about the arts, and Megan also mentioned something um, just on LinkedIn yesterday about STEAM. So there's STEM, but there's science, technology, engineering, the arts, and um, and whatnot. And I just want to really also, from my point of view, speak to the fact that. Uh, my background, in fact, in terms of my educational background is um, 
my, I studied at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and my degree was like half a communications degree. So there was a wide variety of, of um, areas that I learned, including anthropology, that have nothing to do with design tools or development or whatnot, but are incredibly applicable to my role. And I, I do love seeing more and more arts fo folks and people with different perspectives, you know, such as the humanities really bring that like fresh perspective and different ways of looking at things um, to just add like a, a certain level of um, different approaches. And that is more inclusive. It is more diverse. It, it, it enhances the ability of teams to be creative. And um, yeah, so thank you. Mandy, thank you, Neef. Mandy, I saw you had your hand up as well there. Did you have something you'd like to add? I did, um, kind of echoing that, I think we need to think about where we are in our careers and what um, level of power we have. So for some of us, I don't need, um, you've done it, I've done it, I've seen Carla do it, like we have a little bit more um, ability to do some of those things without putting ourselves in a position where we may threaten our higher ability or our ability to retain a job. And so I think that's really important to think about and remember for women in different positions where in some cases um, it's a different level of ability to speak up or speak out. I think it's really important to, if questioned. Um, so for example, I used MCE as an excellent example and Florian would be hundred percent comfortable with me telling the story. I'm sure without me asking him that, when we initially started saying, how do we get more um, gender diverse students into the programs? <laughs> the first thing he did was turn to the one female student that was at our event and said, can you go find me 20 more people like you? <laughs> and I had overheard him and I immediately jumped in. And I was like, no, no, no. You are not going to make her do that work. That is your job. Um, you can ask her for help, but pay her to do it or hire someone to help with that. Um, one of the biggest things um, that was a topic of conversation in my crowd on International Women's Day was uh, a friend had posted, had reshared from uh, kind of a well-known advocate who had said, don't empower me, pay me. And then all her comments were mansplaining about, well, can't we empower you as well? And it's like, yeah, for sure. But pay transparency, I think, is really important. And for a young person starting out in their career, I think it's a very reasonable question to ask. One of the biggest things we see in tech is no pay scale posted in a job ad. And I think it's okay to ask that question. I've seen local companies lately refuse to answer even through a second round of interviews. And I think that's something we need to advocate a little bit more for is that pay transparency piece so that we understand and make sure people are getting paid the same. Talk to your coworkers, have open conversations about pay. And I think that's a... A kind of a barrier that exists for for young and women where you're put into those roles so those you know you're going to be the marketing or the hr person you're going to be the front end developer because you're going to make it look pretty you're going to be the person assumed to take notes in a meeting because your handwriting is better because you're a woman like those kinds of things where um it's okay to speak up and say actually i'm not particularly skilled at that that's a that's a different role than mine or or what have you um so I think all of those things, when we talk about kind of um, what Megan said with the myth busting and, and how, we, how we look at that at different levels in our careers, it's important that we kind of use the skills or the network or the power that we have to, to make that change. And I would encourage uh, young women and gender diverse individuals to lean on the people above you and the people around you. And, um, but also feel free to speak your mind. Yeah, so that's, that's some, some great advice there, Mandy, for sure. And, you know, thinking about our, our audience here today and that there are, you know, that this event was, it was being put off for, uh, for women and gender diverse people who are interested in exploring or looking at the opportunities in tech. I think that there's a few things that have really, uh, I know resonated for me, I think, out of our overall conversation on that uh, piece around, you know, that there are endless opportunities out there, you know, and it doesn't matter what your background uh, is. Um, you don't need to have a technical or a purely tech background. Um, your skills may be very transferable. Um, that there's lots of support out there to, to look at those things, to have the conversations. 
um, to assist in, in, you know, making some career decisions or getting prepared to, uh, you know, to go after a, a job or, or a career switch, um, as we've talked about, and that there is lots of work in the sector. Um, and lots of work is being done to be more welcoming and inclusive. I think a lot of these, I think it's important that we continue to have these conversations and that we keep, uh, you know, that accountability uh, piece there and that we talk about it, it is still the reality uh, of what's out there, but there is, there's a lot of good things happening there. Um, so kind of in a switch gears and, and, and we still have a little bit of time here. Um, I'd like to kind of throw a question out there and by all means, please, uh, raise your hand, uh, either the uh, icon or your actual hand, if you'd like, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, if you have a, have an answer for this one, uh, tell us about a cool project or innovation that people may not be aware of that has happened um, or is happening um, now in our province. If I can jump in. Sure. I'm going to use this for self-promotion. Well, not literally self, but <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've talked so much about entering the industry and whatnot and talent gap and stuff. So I just wanted to take like 30 seconds to explain what our team does at Tech and Ella and why, you know, we're here in case this is something you want to do. So formed from the fact that all the industry was telling us we're having problems finding, uh, you know, people to come work for us. We are a team of five people. Um, we have someone who focuses on high school. So her name is Susan Kelly. She actually used to be a teacher. Now she's in tech. Um, she is going out into schools, talking to kids and trying to move them into the, you know, pipeline into our industry. Uh, we have Liam Flanagan, who focuses on local and post-secondary. So if you're somebody who lives in the province and you're trying to move into tech, Liam actually will one-on-one -on -one kind of talk through things, resume. We're not replicating services. So like there are resume writing services that exist. They are the experts at those things. We're doing the translation level almost, right? Which is these are the jobs and we know these companies and the kind of things they're looking for. Let us help you kind of match those things up. And probably not as applicable to the audience here, but maybe it is. Um, we have two people, Haven Hardas and Melissa and Ulrich, who focus on international and newcomer talent. So attracting people to the province with the right skill sets, but also, you know, if you're a newcomer here, um, you know, if you're a migrant, if you are a family member of someone who came here and you're interested in our sector, or if you're here as an international student um, and you're interested in the sector, we kind of, again, play that in-between role. So I just think that I know that I'm obviously incredibly biased, but I do think it's cool that our industry said, this is the thing that we actually need. It's great to talk about, you know, having all these people in our industry, but unless we put the time and money behind doing it, it's not really going to happen. So I just wanted to share that because I do think it's cool and innovative that our industry has decided to do that. Absolutely. And I think your group is very cool as well. <laughs> I'll say, and we've, uh, we've begun to collaborate and work very closely. And I, I'll say that your group is one of those group of experts in a specific area. We lean on your expertise. So we may do those specific resume writing workshops on that. But when it comes to the translation to tech, um, that's, you know, certainly an area um, um, where, where we would point, uh, point over to your, the talent on your team there. I think it's absolutely fabulous that you exist there. Uh, Anna Gray, do you have something to add? on a cool project or, or something that's happening in the tech sector? Yeah, so I spoke earlier about our evolution program. We'll be uh, restarting a cohort in June, so applications are open for that. We're also holding uh, our Pigeon Pit competition April 6th at Farrafin. It'll be in person, but there's also a virtual viewing option. Um, so I'll drop a link for the Eventbrite. Uh, all are welcome to attend. We'd love to see you there. Fabulous. And Mandy, I noticed you mentioned Bounce as well. I mean, you know, we've talked about a number of, I think, organizations and groups here. Bounce, when it comes to health tech, uh, has a variety of events and things. Um, you know, another group I, I think of, too, as well is, is Oceans Advance and their work in, in the marine tech uh, side of things. And, and I know Kathy over there would be happy to talk to anyone who might be interested in looking at uh, careers or that particular side of the industry or sector as well. Um, Anna, raise your hand up again. 
No, a leftover. Okay, fair enough. Just checking. I wasn't sure. I thought it disappeared and it came back. So I just wanted to make sure. And I know given what you do and where you work, you might have a bunch of cool projects to talk about. So I thought I'd throw that in there. Well, I noticed that we are near the end of our uh, session here, and it's been an absolutely fabulous conversation. I can't believe how fast the time has gone by, actually. Um, so I'd like to thank, you know, all of our panelists uh, for your time and participating in this conversation today. You are all exceptionally inspiring. Um, I hope our attendees have been inspired to, um, you know, think more about or pursue uh, careers in the sector. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing so much uh, of yourselves here today. There's been a lot of very personal and great stories. You've really been putting yourselves out there. And I think that that um, is fantastic and we really appreciate it. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, and particularly the Department of Immigration, Population Growth and Skills. Um, they do uh, support and fund our work uh, in our career services and our employment assistance work, as well as our labor market partnership and our employer services work. Um, so this event um, and our work is, is uh, you know, is, is happening today, uh, thanks to their support. Um, and we really like to thank our attendees uh, for being a part, spending time with us here today. Um, I hope you all feel empowered, connected, motivated, uh, ready to take on the next step in your career journey. <clears throat> and I encourage you uh, to all check out the exhibitor booths that are in the exhibition hall here in Feed Loop. Um, make connections, reach out, explore the options and the possibilities out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we encourage you to explore the Feed Loop platform, um, including our other recorded sessions. There are a variety of recorded sessions available there as well. Um, there's exhibitor booths, there's panelist profiles, um, and follow up with each other using the networking feature that's found in the navigation bar above the virtual tour feature. Um, I will remind everyone again that the event has been recorded. It can be rewatched. It will be accessible for quite some time. We'll be promoting it. Um, so even if people were unavailable this morning to attend in person, all these, you know, this session as well as the others um, and the booths will be available for quite some time. So we encourage people to revisit, rewatch, share. Um, and we would um, appreciate it if you would take some time to complete our feedback survey. Your feedback is really important to us and it helps us to host future panels and events that meet your needs. Um, and finally, stay connected with us on social media platforms and stay tuned for future Tech Connect events. Um, we really uh, look forward to the next steps and the next stages in our work uh, in this industry and in this sector. Um, so thank you all for attending um, and have a great day, everyone.